Hey, feel good fathers. I am joined today by my man, Tony. He's got, uh, he is a girl dad. Uh, he has a very interesting, unique story. We were catching up, <laughs> catching up off air and we were chuckling. And then he asked me this great question. I was like, you know what? Let's simply hit record yeah, and get this all captured. Let's just, let's just go for it. So Tony, um, give us a, a brief overview of, of you and let's jump right into our discussion. Yeah, great. Let's go. It's funny because I, I was, I was going to tell you that when I do my, my show, cause I've been doing my show for nine years, I just start now. I just start the recording when I first, like we first connect. Cause you, sometimes the good stuff's at the beginning and you right. don't even realize it. So, uh, I have, um, uh, I come from a therapist background. I have been a, a coach and a therapist for a number of years. Um, I have a uh, talk uh, podcast now called She Talks Confidence. It's the third generation of my podcast. It's an interview-based show. Uh, I am a women's empowerment coach. I focus on confidence. Uh, that's what I did through uh, Brand Builders Group, which has been fantastic. And uh, I, be I am here because of my daughter. Um, I, I raised her on my own practically since I think we got divorced when she was about one, give or take. And it's been a wild and interesting ride and one that is just fraught with levels of discovery, especially from a man's perspective, being a girl dad, just incredible. And I think that energy that I got from raising her uh, kind of transitioned into maybe even subconsciously into me gravitating towards or my clients being women, We're usually women 25 to 45 ish going through transitionary phases and looking for maybe just not another woman to talk to, but maybe getting a little bit of a different perspective because I'm, I am not a woman. I never profess to be one and I don't have the same perspective, but I do have a perspective of a girl dad and somebody that's very caring. And I try to be as understanding as possible and raising her for her entire childhood and up to you know, young adulthood I've gained some levels of insight, which are really surprising. And I actually talk about that on my keynote is the fact that you just don't realize as a kid growing up, or even as a young dude, uh, the different world that women live in. And so mm. that's brought me up to me creating right now. I'm in the midst of creating an online program called uh, true confidence for women. I've got a uh, small uh, little ebook that I put together and I mean, as of like a couple of days ago. So this is all very fresh in terms of me creating these things and a new website and the new website's called the confidence doc.com. And for feel good fathers and anybody listening, you will find links to everything brand builders, the website, the podcast, the whole thing down in the description on YouTube or in the description on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, you said something I thought was really interesting. Uh, well, two things that were really interesting. The first was really that discovery of the father of raising your daughter and kind of these little milestones and pieces along the way. Anything crazy that you want to share that would be uh, super insightful? <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a couple of funny and a couple of interesting ones. The the interesting one is she was she as a as a girl was talked to differently from the men in the family. And I found that interesting because I didn't realize it until I was on the, I, I was having the perspective of being her dad and being, you know, more of that protector or being more of the, I always have my one eye is always, you know, on her, you know, running around, making sure she's not, to, you know, doing belly flops off the stairway or something. So that was an interesting thing. The fact that they were talking to her as a girl differently than they would talk to a boy. It was just, and it was. It's just part of the systemic aspects that we have in terms of culture and gender roles. I'm not saying it was bad. I'm just saying it was different. And one thing as a dad, I, I just didn't realize as a dude, you know, as a, as a 25 year old guy, I just thought, you know, everybody's kind of rolling along. Everybody's the same. It was just, that was kind of a, hmm, type of a moment. And the other, the other thing, and I actually have that in my keynote is the fact that it's the stuff that women go through that we do not. And we do not have the, the perspective that we don't, we don't have the understanding of the levels, the layers of an onion that they have to deal with that we do not have to deal with. And my example is 
uh, getting nails done or uh, getting their hair done. I remember my daughter uh, went into the hair salon when she first started getting to like preteen and stuff and wanted to get like a legitimate, not like going to super cuts or something, which I, I mean, I got to admit, I took her to super cuts. I thought, you know, what's, what's the big deal? Of course, she gets into preteen and, and she wants to get a decent haircut. And so she goes into the place. We found a really nice place. I thought, no problem. Because if when I go into a salon, uh, my haircut was 40 bucks, 35, 40 bucks. And, uh, and so she, I go, okay, well, let me know when you're done. And then uh, I'll, I'll walk in. We'll pay. No problem. So she lets me know and uh, walk in. And the guy goes, that'll be 150, 160 bucks or something. And I go, so I turned to her and I said, did you buy half the shelf of product? And she goes, no, that's the, that's how much the haircut was. And I just lost, I lost it. I mean, not in like a crazy, you know, way, but I thought you gotta be kidding me, man. And I, I must've looked, looked like the biggest idiot standing there at the cashier, <laughs> uh, having this internal turmoil of like, I, I cannot believe I'm paying this much. And the whole time afterwards, you know, driving back, I'm like, are you kidding? And she kept telling me, no, that's how it is. I never realized up till that point that that was because that's not my world. And we don't have to go through those things or, uh, you know, or buying clothes or makeup. I don't know if, uh, if, you know, you've been through the, the machinations and the layers and the steps involved in just going through the makeup and how much that stuff cost. It was crazy. And so that's the type of thing that, in, that opened my eyes up. And I know if I didn't have a daughter, you know, in relationships, yeah, you have that. But when it comes to having a daughter, it's a little bit of a different angle to it. And with girlfriends or wives, they go through makeup and that. And they, they may say something here and there, but you're not tuned into it like you would be if it was your daughter and you were you know, paying directly or you were really uh, paying attention in terms of, okay, she's 13. I don't want her to have a bunch of stuff on her face type of thing. So I was, and I, and, and that was a, those are very, you know, surface, but eye opening experiences to the fact that it's a different life. And it's, and it's, and the problem comes down to the fact that a lot of men, most men, uh, don't, they haven't been afforded that experience. And so when the women come to me, from uh, like a counselor or therapist perspective, they're, they're talking about, you know, how do I, it's all about communication, right? But if, but if somebody's at a higher level or if somebody's speaking Mandarin and somebody's speaking Cantonese, which is both Chinese, but a little bit different, there might be some issues in regards to exactly knowing where somebody is or what somebody wants or what somebody how does, needs. How does this relate to, uh, what you mentioned about the confidence crisis when it comes to uh, for fathers understanding their daughters better. The, the confidence issue, especially, well, from a women's pers perspective, because that's the population that I deal with, it's because they, they go into a, a, a two reasons. The first reason is, is the systemic aspects, the, the character, characteristics at the beginning, which because they're much more in tune emotionally, they uh, they become much more in tune with people pleasing or much more in tune with with understanding what somebody wants. And so they you know, they can be the perfect student or they can be the one that is, you know, not screwing up or not doing things because they're they're more in tuned with expectations. So that creates a level of uh, perfectionism sometimes. Then when they get to the to the out to the career time you actually need the other gear you don't need that you need the gear where you are a little more self sufficient you are more uh, aggressive if that i mean that's a, that's an aggressive word but you are more aggressive and more proactive i guess assertive in, is a good word yeah assertive exactly that's a perfect word uh, in the workforce in order to sort of create your space and uh, create the team aspect that you want to. Yet, a lot of times, because of the system in place, and a lot of times subconsciously, they get to that point in terms of the career. And then there's this confidence crisis because they're not confident in being able, being able to hold their own. They're not confident in raising their hand in the meetings. They're not confident the fact that they're they're 
word or their opinion means as much mm. as somebody else. And it's you, interesting. It's uh, you mentioned system. What c- can you describe? I'm, I was kind of like at edge of my seat. Like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like, yeah, it's the, the it, I mean, it's, yeah, it's no grand conspiracy thing. It's just that it's just the, I don't want to say misogynistic, but it's just the paternal system that we have in place. It's be, it's mm. just the way societies have grown is the fact that, that men have been the ones who have shaped society for the most part. I mean, women have just only recently, in recent history wise, uh, been able to vote. So uh, it's it's been how the system has been in place. And then the established gender roles uh, that, that women have been dealing with over the, the past years. And of course, ERA started uh, the um, equal rights uh, started the push started in the 70s or so. And they have uh, progressively gotten a little bit better and a little bit better. And it is different now than it was then. But there still is a system in place that persists. And as a girl dad yourself, I'm, I'm thinking you'll either you ha- either have seen some of that or you'll be more in tune with it when it comes up or when your daughters come back and and say something about, oh, you know, I was in class or I'm at my job or this and this and this. And, I, you know, I can't believe they did this, and that type of thing. That's what I'm talking about. It's th- the system. It's it's just that underlying flow that we all are in, but we don't know we're in it. Totally. And and I'm, I'm completely aware of all these aspects. I was just, I thought there might be, um, I was curious about your perspective. Like secret sauce or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, Oh, oh it's like, Oh, it's, 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 I, no, it's man, good. I, there. I, yeah. Yeah. I wish I could, I wish I could have a, you know, a, a new, a, an alert here and like, you know, break open everything like, uh, you know, like the vault or something, but no, no, it's just, it's just the basic, yeah. you know, massaging system. A hundred percent. Okay. I, I remember when uh, my daughter was super young and we were in Florida, it was one of the things we were very, it was crazy. We were very sensitive to was the way that she was being treated and the world and sort of the expectations on her for who she should be and how she should act. And we moved away from Florida because of this. Uh, so we were in, we were in Gainesville. So you have mm-hmm. asked like, you're right. Florida. Half the t- yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's a very educated population, mm-hmm. uh, very very up and coming, uh, lots of really great stuff there. But of course, when school's out, the population is half mm-hmm. <laughs> in the whole city because it's mm-hmm. mostly students. And even there, I remember just just a little like, yes, dear, be a good girl. Those kind of elements. We were like, yeah. I remember. So I'm Canadian from the north. My wife is a New Yorker yeah. from from the the northeast. Right, and we were both. No, <laughs> like, both like, right. like no, right. no grits here. No girls raised in the South kind of thing. Like, yeah, that's not a combination, but it's not the world that we wanted to have her grow up in mm-hmm. because assertiveness and speaking up is something that we think is a really great quality. Mm-hmm. And so she actually will be assertive with us. Now mm-hmm. we're still the, as the parents, we're still the authority figure. We're still laying the groundwork of the rules and all that kind of jazz and helping her out. Yeah. On the other side, she's one that's, that said like, well, no, you said this or, hey, I, you know, I want it because I want it. Like just, just the standard stuff that we need more women uh, to talk about. I believe this is talked about in the book, The Confidence Code. Uh, Love a it. really great friend. Uh, please watch her TED Talk. Reagan Cannon has, a fa- there it is. There's the book. Has uh, Reagan Cannon has a fantastic TED TEDx talk on this mm-hmm. about women getting promoted and all that kind mm-hmm. of jazz. So this is a real situation. Um, the statistic from Reagan is this. It's um, 50% frontline managers, women, fantastic number, but only 25% once you get above uh, the director level is, and in mm-hmm. particular the C-suite. So mm-hmm. there's uh, room to improve. And then one last thing before we get to the next stage was that you mentioned the ERA something that I, I'm not even sure if it's been ratified yet. I heard about this years it ago. Not. It still needs one or two state yeah. signatures. So unbelievable, unbelievable find out. And so what this does is that it simply gives and extends the rights uh, to man in the constitution as a constitutional amendment to the word woman. Mm-hmm. And it needs like two states to ratify it. Yeah. So, and there's, I, I don't unfortunately know which states those are, but 
check it out on Google, see if your state is one of the ones that needs to ratify it and talk to your representative, get that thing ratified. And we can, um, you know, women's suffrage is important. That's kind of the main reason for it, which is about voting. Uh, and that would just, that just guarantees the right for women to vote, which I think it's is just, right. It's just about having the right. It, it's not about it, it, a lot of people sit there and go, Oh, you're trying to take the jobs away. Are you trying to make them equal? Blah, blah, blah. Well, first of all, women and men aren't equal. They're not supposed to be equal. They're just women and men, right? It's like apples and oranges. It's just giving them the choice, giving them the ability to have the same options that we have if they want to. That's what it's all about. It's not about, but it's, it, it's the same thing that they talk about uh, in regards to, you know, getting a certain amount of people in, um, in colleges or whatnot. It's not necessarily that it's just taking the systemic aspects away, the limitations, the ceiling away in order for anybody man or woman to be able to kind of go up or down or left or right or wherever they happen to want to go. And unfortunately, as progressive as we have been a little, although we've really regressed here a little bit here, but uh, over the you know past 30 or 40 years, it still exists. The system still exists. And it's a matter of just allowing or ha helping people to become more aware of it. And in the, and in the meantime, helping my clients to come to me that, that have a false notion of what confidence is, understand what it really is, and then have that internal foundation with them in order to see where the boundaries are and then to exceed them where they can. This begs the question, what really is confidence? What confidence is, is what people think confidence is, is contextual confidence. I call it small c or lowercase c confidence. Contextual confidence is confidence in the moment or confidence that gets confused with competence, competence mm. in terms of doing something like, oh, I can, you know, you go someplace and, you know, the, like karaoke. Oh, I can't sing. Well, maybe you're not competent in singing because you haven't practiced or anything having to do with situation or uh, uh, giving a big speech and not really being a speech person. You don't have any confidence. Somebody says, drags you up on stage. You're like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? That's a competence issue. Inner confidence or, or, or capital C confidence, which is true confidence, is just the, the acceptance and the essence of yourself, the understanding that you may, some things may work, some things may not. But the, but the point is, you start from where you're at, you accept yourself for warts and all, and you just move through life one step at a time being whole and complete. Nobody's broken. Nobody needs to be fixed. You are whole and complete. It's a matter of just reframing things, gaining a different perspective on things, and then moving forward empowered because you have it already. I give my clients nothing they don't already have. That's what true hmm. confidence is. Got it. Got it. So you're, you're mentioning in being empowered and, and sort of moving through life in that way. Another thing that you talk about a lot is empowering through stories. So what's this about? Well, empowering through stories, it, it, which is the basis of my podcast. And I think that it's really important from an empathetic point of view or for a sympathetic point of view that, uh, that people share their own personal stories, especially women that have gone through things and are, and are on the other side, uh, whether it turned out the way they wanted to or not. Because sometimes, as you know, the thing you think you want, ultimately when you go through the process and the steps and you get there, it's really not what you want or it's not where you ended up, not where you were supposed to end up. So the confidence and the empowerment through stories is just having somebody, because we are all about stories. I mean, it, it, everything's about story. Marketing is about stories you know, connection is about stories. It's about creating that level of connection. And that's why I, I love the format, the interview format where a woman, you know, one of my guests would come on and talk about something that they did in the past where it, they were in a, a, a bad situation, struggled through something, you know, fell down, got up, fell down, got up, and then found a way to transition through there. It's the hero's journey. If anybody, mm. you know, if a lot of people that, I mean, BBG's big on the hero's journey. The hero's journey is huge. If you don't know about that, most movies are based on 
the hero's journey. Harry Potter, Star Wars, Wizard of Oz, all of those are the, are the hero's journey. So understanding that, it's about crafting or understanding you're in your own story. You're the hero. So empower yourself to take the steps to you know make a good movie. And that's what I love about what my clients or what my guests share with me on the show is they show they show any listener that is listening at that point that whatever you happen to go through, you can find a way out of that and forward. Now it may not end up where you think, but you will move forward and it's, you know, one step at a time. It's 1% a day. It's just, it's the small movements. It's the micro movements that create the larger picture at the end. And you look back, you're like, wow, look how, you know, look how much more expansive everything is. It's not big jumps because your ego will not let you do big jumps. It'll shut you right down. And that's why I, that's why I love stories. I love basing my show on uh, stories of empowerment. And I, you know, I absolutely adore this because this is the exact reason for Feel Good Fatherhood and why the show exists as well. That, uh, you know, when I was starting out 11 years ago with my eldest, uh, there was a tons of stuff that was going on. But in in short, I had moved across the country. I didn't have a support network. I was figuring everything out myself. And then six months later, my my father died. And so I was kind of processing everything at once. And there mm. just wasn't access to the information that there was today. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it was out there. It was just a little bit more difficult uh, for me, just not really knowing where to find things and information wasn't as ubiquitous as it is today. Mm-hmm. And so that's why Feel Good Fatherhood exists. And it's really to to tell those those exact stories. Um, what what are the stories of who you're serving? What are the stories of your family? That kind of jazz so that Feel Good Fathers themselves can learn and apply what they're doing uh, to level up, to skill up. It's, mm-hmm. I think it's a, I think it's the time honored human tradition of sitting around a campfire and telling the story about the purple berried bush that made Fred sick. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's, I think that to, to wrap that into your theme and to the fatherhood theme and to myself and my daughter, I think a, a really good goal of any father is to yeah, end up a few years down the road. And I'm almost, I'm 58 now, uh, it, to end up, you know, a few years down the road and, and look, look back and, and go, you know what? I got like a million stories with me and my daughter, like a million, and they keep coming. And I think that if you, if, if your goal is to just be involved and your goal is to help out and your goal is to be a good, not only a good teammate, but of course a good supporter, um, it, and be a, for me, uh, being a dad was somebody that allowed her to grow. That was my mentality, uh, in, in raising her. I gave her a lot of rope. Uh, sometimes that was really, really hard from a dad's perspective. Uh, my family gave me a lot of, a lot of guff about that because they came from a very matter of fact, linear binary, you know, you, this do as I say, not as I do, you know, because I said so nonsense. I never believed any of that kind of stuff. And now she's 31 and uh, I have two grandkids now. She's got kids. And now I can see how great of a payoff that choice was in raising her that way because I raised her to find herself. Mm. And I know that so many kids go through that type, not you know when they're young young and getting in for first getting into school they're great because they just don't care right they just they're just trying to figure stuff out and find their stuff and then they get sort of not indoctrinated but they sort of fall in line and get sort of placed in certain and then there's expectations on them of course i always had boundaries always my boundaries are just maybe a little bit further apart and i always and i always told her you can make mistakes. Just don't make really dumb mistakes, like really stupid, like big mistake. Don't make any big mistakes. Uh, and, it, and with that, I think with that environment of, of growth and support that she got from me, uh, it's gone a long way. And, um, she's just, she's in a really great space. She's, uh, very self-assured, self-possessed, and, uh, she's an amazing mom. So, me looking back, I got a bunch of fun stories with her and 
she's doing great and that's all that matters to me. I think it's I think it's absolutely wonderful. And that's really the the measure and what we aspire to as feel good fathers is that number one, we have a great relationship with our kids as they get older. And then number two, you know, really the measure is are your grandkids okay? Yeah. You know, because that's really the measure yeah. of have you done well? And when we look at one of the things that we talked about, you mentioned was sort of a generational pattern. Is that when we look at families and and folks that have improvement to make or a, a different decision to make, we can say that uh, to break from their families, mm -hmm. largely that comes from those generational patterns. And so being able to instill the next the next set of values and and kind of restart the line, so to speak, that's really uh, very aspirational. And I say that because when we look at healthier families that have generational legacy and that are, are let's just say healthier, they're just healthier mm -hmm. boundaries, healthier mm -hmm. parents, healthier kids, healthier grandparents, the whole deal. There's that identity of the family that is first and foremost, and then it kind of goes from there. And so, yeah. um, and a that's, healthy identity too, right? I mean, yes. one that's one that's everybody's supportive, everybody's, you know, it, it, an individual, everybody's uh, accepted as the individual. It's interesting because that generational uh, break is first you have to know that it's there. So there's a level of awareness that has to be there. And I, and honestly, I didn't even see that until I went back. I went back to grad school when I was the, like past, a little past 30 into psych into psychology because I was originally a finance major that's why I have a real estate business and then uh, and then after getting out of that then I went into my PhD and it wasn't until that transition it wasn't until mm -hmm. I really kind of dug deep that I realized the the pat the family pattern that I was in mm -hmm. and was able to make make some adjustments and make some shifts now in in the process of that I lost I lost some relationships because I decided not to play on that playground, I decided to, you know, be in a different realm and, and, and the people that I, the, my family members and, and people around that knew me and accepted me for, you know, living within that smaller bubble and operating that way, they weren't cool with that, or they were uncomfortable with that. And so I lost a lot of tribe. Well, I gained some new ones that were more supportive and more understanding. But in moving, so you have to be aware of that, the generational stuff first, and then to create the escape velocity to get out is, is a is kind of tough. It's, if it's a tough job, but that's what counselors are for and therapists are for and books are for and, you know, it, and anything in regards to how to take a little bit, just a little bit of a different approach. It's not, you don't have to like pivot 180. You just have to reframe it just a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left and to start to you know generate a a new better more supportive uh, approach and you know, I couldn't be uh, happier or or more you know blessed for the fact that I somehow some way uh, found that way and was um and kind of wanted to to do that wanted to go back and do that and I was and I'm very grateful for that I think it's very critical as well as we're talking about fatherhood and masculinity that one of the core elements of what we would consider healthy masculinity or mature masculinity is this idea of maintaining really positive and healthy for using the same word again, mm -hmm. uh, relationships and being able to model those interactions with your children, being able to model those for your spouse and kind of authoring and creating the peer group that not only you're around, but also that your family is around can have a tremendous impact. And this isn't to say that you're kith and kin. This isn't to say that the generational lines are healthier and healthy, although they can be. Mm -hmm. But I, I also think in another world, we really need to adopt that same level of empathy and compassion that we have for the individual and extend that to the other generations. Mm -hmm. If we go back, you know, even just a hundred years ago, your line who you survived from has had major lifestyle shifts from an agrarian society into an urban industrial society. That in and of itself is a huge deal. Major uh, breaking apart and dissolving of powerful, powerful peer groups, powerful, powerful communities, uh, whether that be local farming communities, small villages, mm -hmm. uh, the religious movement in the US, et cetera, et cetera, so going down to the point where we've had 
not long ago, huge number of world wars. You know, mm -hmm. if we go from just the Prussia, um, Austria, Prussia, the Bismarck Wars, which mm -hmm. is like about 40 to 50 years pre World War One, World War Two, I am getting my world history way mixed up. <laughs> I can already tell. I didn't, I didn't know then... how far back you're going to go, like revolutionary <laughs> or, you know, just get, yeah. Yeah, the uh, yeah. So World you War know, One, World War Two, yeah, exactly. We're, you know, Vietnam, Korea, all those mm -hmm. different things, and so we just have these generations of people that have had major upheaval, major global situations uh, where there's fighting and soldiers and industrial and in, uh, industries built and, and crazy resources expended, and we're we are now simply outside of uh, Ukraine, Russia. We're in a mm -hmm. time of peace for the past. 20, 30 years, if you mm -hmm. consider Europe, if you consider Europe and, and the US, like relatively, you know, we're not mm -hmm. ignoring 9 11 or any other, you know, mm -hmm. any of the other things that are going mm -hmm. on. But as far as like major country on country conflict, it's been a bit. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're just now, I think, as a, as a, as a race, just like catching our breath and saying, like, oh, let's process all this. Right. <laughs> like, you know, lots of stuff happened. Yeah, it's funny you uh, you bring that up. It, when I first went into my grad school thing, my my whole thing was uh, I'm going to save the world, right? Because my I'm a uh, savior. I have a savior <laughs> complex. It's a whole my own personal psychological thing. And I went in. I'm like, I'm going to go in. I'm going to learn psychology. I'm going to become a therapist. I'm going to get my PhD. Blah blah blah. Write books. Blah blah. I'm going to save. I'm going to figure it out and save the world. We're not close to that. We we really are as as a society and as a culture, especially given the fact we we found out a lot of information over the past six years, I will tell you that. And given that, it I think it provides a good perspective because it's more, we have more evidence, especially with the internet and the impact of the internet and the technology, the information age. And that, and that brings me to, actually, I have a question because we talked about right before the show, the fact that you have an 11 year old and now you have a newborn. 11 years between those two, and you talk about societal change. What do you see? I mean, 11 years, that's a big shift. You have now you have a daughter, two daughters, you have that big gap. Are you going to do things differently? Are you going to, what do you see are the differences from a father's perspective uh, in moving forward with your two daughters? Uh, well, thanks. This is, uh, I, I'll take all the pressure on my shoulders, uh, for this piece. I think, right. I think for my eldest, right. If we're, if we're, if we're taking a decade ago, it was still, you know, we were kind of coming out of and entering into a world where let's just send them outside to play. And that was, that was kind of, there mm -hmm. was a little bit more resistance against the technology, a little bit more resistance against the sitting at home. Uh, people, uh, I think it was 2014 when Facebook hit the mobile, mm -hmm. hit mobile phones. Was that, mm -hmm. was that the year? And there was uh, a yeah, huge, you, yeah, around there. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Huge increase in mental health issues. And so when I think yeah. about that time period, it was like, yeah, it's super obvious. Don't give them a phone, send them outside to go play, pick up a book. And I'm very happy to say that with my eldest, she's a reader. Mm -hmm. She loves drawing. She creates art. She, she loves roller skating. We've done martial arts together. So we've had these activities mm -hmm. and I, and there was less pressure to, to do that. Now with my youngest, it's a fundamentally different landscape. It's almost, we, we recently had a, uh, a bus mix up scare. So mm. eldest daughter, now mind you, we've just moved across the country. So we're in a, we're in a new place first, like it's the first or second day on the new bus route. Mom goes to pick her up from the bus stop. Daughter's not there. Uh oh. <laughs> so, oh. so this activates, and not only is daughter not there, but then the bus driver is like, "This is what he. This is what he. Or, I think it was. This is what she said. Every kid that was supposed to get off at this bus stop got off. So you can oh. imagine my my wife and mom was like, "What? <laughs> you know, from New York? Oh so no. So this all this all occurred, and." Literally a lot of the response once, cause she drove to the school. I stayed here. So mm -hmm. I stayed here. I, I took care of the dog. I ended up walking around the block, just figuring like is, what's going on. What's all happening. She drove to the school. The questions literally were, well, did you text her phone or did you call her? It's like, well, hold on. She's in sixth grade. Yeah. 
Why is the expectation? Like, why are we acceding to this technological expectation of our kids? This is not my job as a parent to make sure she has a phone. You as the custodians, as the guardians of her in the trusted system of the school system, Department of Transportation and Department of Education, when we hand her off, she is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so um, anyways, we're talking to the superintendent. Um, but all this kind of stuff happened. And that's like, so this expectation of phone with the eldest. So now I'm looking at my one-year-old and I'm saying, okay, there's a tremendous amount. There's, there's more content produced in like a two-year period than a human being can consume in their entire life. Yeah. So there's more data, more pressure, more electronics. We're just now hitting AI and we have it yet to unlock. And it's going to be very scary when we do where the AI can learn and invent things with us. I think some of it kind of does that, but imagine the world where we're unlocking healthcare, we're unlocking technology, where we're, imagine the AI is powerful enough where we can unlock time travel. Let's go sci-fi. Why not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. We unlock time travel, something crazy mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. um, micro, micro electronics. We go even further into nano, nanotechnology and we create micro electronics, which is the uh, Keanu Reeves version of uh, the day of the year stood still. Mm -hmm. In any case. Mm -hmm. Right, all the kind of stuff I'm looking at this world where she's growing into, and there's two core elements that terrify me for my daughters. Hmm. Number one, the dating market, the, and it mainly has to do with a lot of the thought leaders, psychologists, PhDs, and stuff like that, that I follow rightly say, and this is a hat tip to Rob Henderson, very specifically that men and boys will raise themselves to the standard set by society. And I think that the core fundamental issue that I have as a girl dad, having two girls, is that I don't think an individual parent is not extending a standard to their son. That's not what I'm saying whatsoever. However, I do think there's still that nonsense statement of boys will be boys that is still acceptable given where we are today. And that's an issue. Um, I'm not happy about that. Um, However, like I still have to be a humanist and have hope because it's, it's part of the journey. That's, that's the first thing The the second core piece, uh, well, I guess the second one was the electronics and technology. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third piece is just navigating this crazy world where we're slipping back and forth between liberal ideas and conservative ideas. And I specifically choose those two terms because I don't want to go down the world of woke and alt-right. Like nobody wants to, those are the, those are the extremes. They're not healthy for anybody, mm -hmm. but liberal and conservative ideas about how the world should be going. I, I really think as a country, we're, we're really becoming more activated because there's a lot of dissatisfaction and navigating that for my youngest selfishly as a father so that my children can thrive, but then also a societal concern I have that why can't we all thrive? Like, why can't we all just thrive? Like mm -hmm. we're in this world, we're looking at the demographics of the U S we're looking at demographics of Canada, all this kind of stuff. There's tons of craziness that's happening. And when it comes back to arguments that we're paying attention to versus arguments that we're not paying attention to two numbers, 10 million and 4 million. There are 10 million households in the United States of America that are food insecure. Mm -hmm. This is a data point by the IRS in 2021. It's worse now. That was mid, right? It's, it's worse now because of everything that's been going on with the economy. Mm -hmm. But 10 million households, food insecure is defined as that family doesn't know where the meal is coming from that day. They're yeah. basically in subsistence. That's the first issue. Here's the number that is going to blow people away 60% of those houses, that's 6 million have one or more adult in the home earning $65,000 a year on average. Mm -hmm. That number is significant because it is $10,000 more a year than the national average of salary in the United States. Yeah. Than the median. Yeah. So what that's saying is that people are hustling. They are working. They're trying to, they're trying to figure it out, but for 6 million families, not Americans, families, they can't put food on the table. And 
that just from a what issues are we focused on perspective, I really want. And um, because of the ubiquity of data, I would rather move to a world where we are paying attention to the stuff that's impacting the day-to-day quality of our lives and less, less, a little bit less on cultural and societal issues, very important. Um, because this does include many of those societal and cultural issues, equity at work, right? Equity among our races, all that kind of stuff, definitely pro it. But some of the other elements, they're just not important. Mm-hmm. Housing crisis, like can you form, can you be a regular working class American and afford housing? Uh, education prices are going to be up. It's going to be, by the time my youngest is 20, it's very likely it could be a million dollars to get a four-year bachelor degree. Yeah. Dumb. Like mm-hmm. that's just stupid. Yeah. Um, uh, food insecurity is a big deal. You're seeing stories nowadays of families that are changing labels on food so that they can afford to feed their family if they have a larger family. Mm-hmm. These are just things that when I think of when I think of the first world, prosperity, America, European, the, basically the weird Western educated industrial something, mm-hmm. something, I forget the other two, mm-hmm. for like the weird societies, I, I keep thinking like, why are we solving third world country issues in our first world country? I don't have the solution. I, I, I'm not educated enough on, the, on all the nuances. I just think that as a society, we can do a little bit better. Oh my God. I, well, we could do an entire, we could do an entire series of shows on that, on society, on the shift, on the reasons why it's shifted because of the, we've had the industrial revolution. We had the, you know, the bronze age we had, in terms of, 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 you know, cultural advances, the information and technological age that we are in right now in its infancy is what's happening. That's the catalyst for a group of people saying, Oh, this is too scary. And we don't want to, you know, expand into that. We'd rather just, we're cool where we're at. Whereas the other people are saying, let's take this and let's create something better. The, something the bigger, something better, happening. something to do, right? Yeah. And, the, and, the and that's, happens. Right, exactly. And the thing is, this train's going to keep chugging along. We're not going to be able to stop this thing. So it's a matter of finally uh, a consensus being able to get on board. But I, I don't want to like really get into that because I'll, I'll go off on that i have very <laughs> strong opinions on that uh, but but i wanted to a couple things that you said i thought were very interesting and i'm coming and this is from a dad of a 32 year old woman now and and a, and a grandfather of a, a nine-year-old uh, granddaughter uh, what i find is is that when i was raising my daughter back in the 90s It was difficult and there were things to navigate, basic things to navigate, the typical stuff. And the fact is that she was a daughter. It was, you know, that that has its own uh, nuance to it. But now, and I just spoke with somebody on my show about this, uh, one of my my women that came on as a guest uh, last week or week before. I asked her, do you think it's much more difficult now to raise a daughter than it would be, you know, to, it, it is so much more difficult to raise daughters, your 11 year old and your newborn, uh, because of the situations that are presented now, I don't think they're going to last. I think we'll try to, we'll eventually sort of figure them out, but looking at it from, uh, uh, me going through the same thing you're going through like 20 years ago. Um, I, I gotta, you know, the, the only thing that I did f- that helped me a lot was the fact that there's a lot of stuff coming in from like you just mentioned, like, like the society stuff and the shifts and the inequities and all that stuff. I, the thing that helped that worked for me with her is just focusing on our little pod and Mm -hmm. making sure that every day she got up and she knew she was loved and supported and she, you know, had matching uh, shirts and pants on and shoes, right. And socks, you know, and all that brush your teeth, all that kind of stuff. And just, and that's how I got through it. And it wasn't like it is now, but that seemed to help me. And I think that going forward, you know, man, it's as, as parents, I mean, that's the only thing we can do as dads, right? I mean, just kind of make sure that that the dating thing would scare the bejesus out of me if I was, you know, uh, you know, 
the, where, you know, you're at or getting into that, that's going to be interesting to see what happens with that. Because I think that, I think we may revert back to the whole thing where, because the online thing is absolute nonsense from a theoretical perspective, from a psychological perspective, online dating, uh, I could you know, go off about, about that. It's, it's not effective at all. I think we might go back to the, you know, who knows who to groups to, you know, something that, and I think that's why, you know, maybe people that meet in church, people that meet volunteering, I think that that's typically, that's a, a much better bed to germinate a relationship from, especially due to the fact that it's shared experience. Right. So hopefully that's the case. Uh, th but I, but I, I just want to, I just want to, you know, give you my, you know, that's the support, and support moving forward, man. And thinking, Oh, I'm glad I don't have to go through it, but it's not an impossible journey, right? For you, but it just, it just, it is more complex and more difficult. And I, I see that and I, you know, and I support you in moving forward with that. And I appreciate that. And one of the, you know, for feel good fathers, this is the model that we as ascribe to is that you get yourself right. You get your relationship with your spouse, right? You get the relationship with your kids, right? Everything else takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. Right. Everything else of that is a skill above, you know, mm -hmm. I, I see all the time, get to know your neighbors, right? You get to know your neighbors, the neighborhood's a little bit better. Yeah. Right. Get that identity. And, okay. So then you get to know your neighbors, the neighborhood's better. Then you get to secondary. Maybe you make another neighborhood better. And as you grow to your competency level of having that positive interaction, the change will occur. And naturally, just by the fact of us as feel good fathers paying attention to our kids, instilling in these values showing them their love, showing them that they can have boundaries, that kind of jazz, the rest will get figured out. Mm -hmm. And as for the boys and the solution to that, I 100% agree with you. The number one thing that I used to tell uh, young men when I was a confidence coach mm -hmm. uh, back in college was simply get a local, get a local bar, get a local community. I met my wife doing uh, Lindy Hop and jazz dancing. Mm -hmm. um, and that was because it was uh, something that I enjoyed. I have a handful of things that I enjoy hobby wise. Fine art is one. I love painting, dancing and swing mm -hmm. dance, Lindy hop, um, uh, martial arts, like that physical movement. I absolutely mm -hmm. love that. Mm -hmm. Met her through that. As she develops as your daughter or your son develops their hobbies and they have something about them that is more than just going to work and then coming home, they will find that affinity with somebody else and they'll mm -hmm. figure it out. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm just looking forward to, because I think that I honestly think I'm a Gen Xer. I think you're probably either Gen X, probably Gen Xer too, right? Or, or millennial, I, I like, write that, like, that, very on the yeah. edge. Cause yeah, I'm like the first year. So I just don't call me a boomer, man. I'm not a boomer. So, uh, but, but I think that I really think the mentality, the perspective of your daughter's generation, the Gen, now they call them like the Gen Z's and the Gen A's or whatever, they call, whatever the younger, younger ones are. I think they're going to be in a lot better space. I really do. I think we've gone through in, with uh, this generation stuff that we're going through right now. I think this is the transition phase. And I think that's why everything's so wonky is because right. there's such a pushback to all of the expansion that we should be doing. And I think that after it settles down and just being on Instagram and uh, being on and, and seeing the younger generation stuff, the Gen Z for change, the, the, uh, some of the guys out there that are doing the, the, the gun, the guys from, that survived the Florida uh, shooting at, at the school, uh, they're doing a lot of, you know, uh, good proactive work out there. I think they have their, their heads on a little straighter and have a better perspective. So I'm hoping that I'm really hoping that that will, uh, f f go into and create a better environment for the groups, for the dating, for, you know, for your daughters and moving forward. I, I certainly hope so. I think, you know, I think that healthy, how do you know that your kids are healthy, right? They play. That's, that's how you know. They, do they feel loved? Do they feel secure? Do they feel safe? Oh, kids that are loved, secure, and safe, they will play, right? So I notice it immediately with both my daughters. It's like, they'll go play whether they're, yeah. you know, whether my 11 year, month old is figuring stuff out around the house or whether it's my 11 year old doing what she's doing to play, you know, mm -hmm. they just figure it out. They feel healthy. They, they you know, they, they're in a good spot. Um, as we age, play looks different, you know, and the game changes. And one of those games and play is, well, can you engage in healthy dating stuff? Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the questions is, is like, 
where are healthy people hanging out? Well, they're not hanging out at the bars. They're not hanging out at the clubs. They certainly aren't doing any any sort of swiping left or right. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not engaging where you mentioned that online dating world. They're trying to build meaningful context, meaningful context and meaningful relationships in their life. And so if you're a person that's looking for somebody that is higher value, number one, um, and this is a feel good fatherhood thing, raise your own value, right? Do the personal development, do the hard work, you know, solve the issues that you have in your own personal life, mindset, physicality, whatever happens to be, right? There's no issue with self-improvement. Everybody should, should, should do it in some way, shape or form. And that can be as little or as much as you can tolerate. Um, and then surround yourself with like-minded people and everything will get, everything will get figured out. Mm -hmm. And so by the same token, you know, while I'm aware of some of these issues and stuff like that, I think it's really important to know what the big issues are mm -hmm. and, um, and being able to align yourself and your mindset and your, you know, as a brand builder group strategist, I help people have impact in the world. Mm -hmm. And so in order for me to effectively have impact in the world, there has to be some discernment in there about, well, what's a big impact and what's a small impact. And we definitely believe, uh, just like you, Tony, it's like, if you have your niched audience, the people that you want to have and make a difference for, for me, that happens to be that 4 million. I didn't answer that, that last number, that 4 million, mm -hmm. that's 4 million houses. And what's, what's meaningful about that number is that in general, that's the number of houses that have one parent. Mm. And because we know the numbers, generally that's mom. Yeah. And so there's a lot of fathers, a lot of men that have abstained through one, one way or another from the responsibility of being a father. And as feel good fathers, this is what we say, get in the house. <laughs> so, so, uh, my man, Tony, uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. If feel good fathers want to get a hold of you, uh, where can they find you? They, the new website's up, which is great. It's either TonyDufresne.com, and I'm sure you'll have that in the show notes in there because my last name is kind of funky, uh, or TheConfidenceDoc.com. And, I, uh, and I've been uh, coaching and counseling for about 13, 14 years now. I, I Specifically, my market is, is women, but I still have men that come to me and we still talk about stuff. I deal with confidence issues specifically in transitionary aspects, right? If you're transitioning from out of college into a job, if you're transitioning from job to job or into a relationship or out of a relationship, uh, something having to do with that, that's, that's what I specialize in the, tr the transition aspects. So you can reach me there. Uh, my show is called She Talks Confidence. That's on all of the major podcast platforms, as well as I have a YouTube channel, uh, Tony Dufresne PhD. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate it. So stop whatever you're doing right now and subscribe to Feel Good Fatherhood. You won't regret it. Awesome. And thanks for that. He's completely right. So Feel Good Fathers, right here is the next video. YouTube has decided that this one is the one to watch. So go ahead and click this one. I guarantee it's going to be one of mine because uh, I have that control of that setting, but click here for the next video.